Um, so again, thank you everybody for logging in today for today's webinar. My name is Mark Driscoll. I'm the program manager for the Preventive Health Program with the Ohio AAP. Um, just a couple things from me today and then we can get started on the presentation. Um, after today's presentation, I'll be sending out more information for how to obtain your CME and MOC Part 2 credit. Um, so that will come in an email uh, most likely tomorrow. If you have any questions as we're going along, through the discussion today, um, please feel free to use the chat to enter those and we'll kind of intersperse those as uh, the presentation is being given. And then I have the honor today of introducing our speaker. Um, Dr. John Duby is a professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Wright State University, Boonshaw School of Medicine, and vice president for academic affairs and community health at Dayton Children's Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. He has a clinical practice in developmental behavioral pediatrics. As a graduate of the Ohio State University College of Medicine, he completed his pediatric residency at Baylor College of Medicine and a fellowship in developmental behavioral pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine. He is a past president of the Ohio chapter of the AAP and the Society for Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics. Thank you, Dr. Dewey. Thank you, Mark, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. It's great to see some familiar names uh, from many aspects of my uh, of my career. So it's it's great to be with you this afternoon. I uh, Mark shared what my current role is, and I'm excited to be transitioning at the end of June to a role as a retiree. So that'll be a, a fun and anxiety provoking tra transition. So. Uh, it's very appropriate that we talk today a bit about anxiety, but really focusing on children between nine and 12 years of age. The Ohio Department of Health is supporting this work, and so they want you all to know that uh, the views and opinions that are expressed here are mine and not necessarily those of the Ohio Department of Health. Um, and we're gonna talk about anxiety in the tween age child. Um, I have no disclosures to share with you today, um, and I have considered the Ohio AAP DEI standards in preparing this presentation, and we're going to talk about some of the potential issues with regard to equity that we all need to be thinking about in the course of our discussion. Um, so we're going to discuss the prevalence, symptoms, causes, and treatment of anxiety in 9 to 12-year-old youth while sharing resources uh, to support the children and their families uh, so that by the end of this activity, you'll be able to identify common presentations of anxiety in preteen children, uh, describe the workup for anxiety in preteen children, and enlist treatment approaches for anxiety and, and even potentially some that you can incorporate into your own practice. Um, so a bit of background just to get us started. Um, anxiety is possibly the most common mental health problem but also uh, the most undertreated. And in particular, in this age group of the nine to 12 year olds, uh, anxiety uh, should really be thought of as the most common mental health problem, uh, much more so than we might see depression uh, in older adolescents. And uh, so really needs to be a focus of our attention in this age group. And unfortunately, oftentimes the time from diagnosis to treatment uh, in some instances can be measured in decades instead of months or, or years. It tends to be a chronic uh, condition, um, but it tends to wax and wane over time. And I often share with families that it, it often runs in families, but it also can be contagious. And, and so that you know, if one member of the family is experiencing and exhibiting signs and symptoms of anxiety, it can often be spread across the household uh, to other members of the family as well. Um, it can be quite general or it can be very specific. We're not gonna talk today at all about specific phobias that are all part of that uh, continuum of anxiety disorders. So we're gonna focus primarily on the more, most common presentations, specifically, uh, separation anxiety, generalized anxiety, and, and to a lesser extent, social anxiety. Although um, anxiety in this age group is, tends to be the primary uh, manifesting uh, symptom, it can be mixed with depression, and that's certainly true in older children as well. 
So I recently um, came across this paper that was uh, focused on the notion of the importance of promoting racial and ethnic uh, equity in psychosocial treatment outcomes for children and adolescents with anxiety and depression, and really noted that those who are in underrepresented groups have greater risks for developing anxiety, have a higher burden from the disorder, are less likely to receive adequate mental health services, and that access may be affected by their physical location or language or income or financing. Um, and they find themselves, and I think this really is true for all of us, is that often our, uh, our need for services is required to fit into the demands of the care delivery uh, model so that uh, there are often are requests for weekly sessions that occur only during work or school hours or uh, and the need for adaptations to have a greater impact than the personalization of goals. So um, just to give a sense about that and looking at Ohio data from the, um, the YRBS study survey that was done in 2001, this looks at what percentage of middle school students, our age group, who most of the time are always felt that they were treated badly or unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. And you can see that, uh, interestingly, the Hispanic and Latino um, populations are, are those who feel most likely uh, to be treated badly or unfairly. But the numbers are still uh, very concerning across the board, and even to see that 6% of all uh, youth in this age group feel that they have been treated badly or unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. <clears throat> so I want to take a little bit broader look and think a little bit about what the impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic has had. I think that we're all really very aware of this, but uh, this study that was published um, in uh, JAMA Pediatrics in November of 2021 looked at global prevalence of depressive and anxiety symptoms in children and adolescents uh, during the pandemic, and uh, were able to look at 29 different studies that included eight, over 80,000 youth, and unfortunately found that a, a quarter were experiencing depression and 20% anxiety, and that this had doubled um, compared with some pre-pandemic estimates. Um, if we look at uh, this study in a little bit, uh, in a little different way, in another study that was published in 2023 uh, that looked at longitudinal studies as opposed to cross-sectional studies of greater than 40,000 children and adolescents across 12 different countries and looking at pre-pandemic to pandemic estimates, the increase in depression symptoms during the pandemic was most evident among uh, females and those from actually relatively higher income backgrounds. Um, we're focused on anxiety today and, and anxiety symptoms were felt to increase slightly during this period, but there was some evidence of a small increase in anxiety symptoms for children and adolescents, again, from relatively higher income backgrounds. So the difference between these two studies is the first is more of a cross-sectional approach and this is more of a longitudinal approach, so they have a little bit different outcomes um, when comparing them in that way. Um, what they do note um, is, that is uh, a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in this systematic review is that there's, and I think we know all of these things, that the higher level of social isolation and the quarantine orders were associated with a fourfold increased risk in stress-related symptoms among children. Uh, our children were spending more time with their screens. Uh, the closures and disruptions related to schooling had a negative impact. Cancellation of extracurricular activities. All of those things led to increased loneliness and also decreased physical activity. And then, of course, because they're not in school, they often did not have access to the school-based mental health supports that were available. Uh, previously to them. And of course, um, the pandemic led to significant changes in all of our families in the family milieu. Um, there were higher levels of parental depression and anxiety symptoms. And again, those can be contagious um, and higher rates of family violence, job loss, and even alcohol consumption. All of these changes then potentially contributing to stress um, in our young people. 
so this burden of early mental illness really um, can lead to and has potentially led to impaired cognition, impaired academic performance, challenges in quality of life, interpersonal functioning, and then even as um, folks get older, impact on their employment, and of course their own physical health. Um, there's data that would suggest that uh, the fact that you have early uh, manifestations of, of mental health issues makes you at higher risk for later psychopathology. Uh, some data would suggest that you're 13 times more likely to meet the diagnostics, diagnostic criteria for generalized anxiety disorder if you've had early symptomatology and 20 times more likely to be diagnosed with depression in adulthood. Um, so what we know about the pandemic really is that widespread uncertainty and at times severe restrictions and repeated disruptions uh, might have pushed some youth, especially female individuals and adolescents beyond their typical stress threshold. And to quote um, the paper, development and widespread availability of timely and evidence-based global mental health prevention and intervention efforts to address childhood mental illness are critically and urgently needed. And that this today is a chance for us to think about what our roles may be in contributing to making that those services more widely available. I think it's too that it's interesting to to expand the context of uh, why we might be seeing some of the um, challenges that we're seeing in our youth today that we might not have seen uh, ten or twenty or thirty years ago. Um, I think some of the work that's recently gotten quite a bit of attention nationally by um, Jonathan Haidt, Haidt is, um, is interesting to consider. Um, he published this paper in uh, March in The Atlantic called End the Phone-Based Childhood Now um, and highlighted the fact that rates of adolescent depression and anxiety seem to be stable in the 2000s, but rose significantly between 2010 and 2019 pre-pandemic. Um, the suicide rate rose in, in 10 to 19 year olds and um, rose significantly for girls in the 10 to 14 age group. And that these findings were similar across the world, not unique to the United States. So he talks about the fact that um, loneliness and friendliness among American teens began to surge around 2012. Um, scores in reading and math began to decline after that period of time and reversed decades of slow but certainly steady increases in those scores. Uh, the declines in math and reading and science seem to happen globally and also beginning in the early 2010s. Now, needless to say, I mean, we're not talking about the fact that all children are struggling. Many young people are flourishing, but many are shyer and maybe potentially more risk averse. Um, but as a group, Gen Z or those born between 1997 and 2012 are in poorer mental health and lagging previous generations on some metrics. And, and what he argues is that if a generation is doing poorly, if it's more anxious and depressed and is starting families, careers, and important companies at a substantially lower rate than previous generations, then the sociological and economic consequences are going to be profound for the entire society. And so he has um, recently published a book called The Anxious Generation. So that if you want to deep uh, dive into some of the thinking around this, that uh, you could take a look at, at, at his book. He's a social psychologist at NYU. And I just um, wanted to highlight two quotes from the paper from The Atlantic. <clears throat> um, and that, you know, what happened in the early 2010s? And he argues that those were the years when adolescents in rich countries traded in their flip phones for smartphones and moved much more of their social lives online, uh, particularly on the social media platforms designed for virality and addiction. And then he also says, once young people began carrying the entire internet in their pockets, available to them day and night, it altered their daily experiences and developmental pathways across the board. Friendship, dating, sexuality, exercise, sleep, academics, politics, family dynamics, identity, everything was affected. Life changed rapidly for younger children, too, as they began to get access to their parents' smartphones and later got their own iPads, laptops, and even smartphones during elementary school. Um, just this morning, my assistant shared with me that her 18-month-old that her granddaughter 
already knows how to find the different apps and open them and other things on on her parents' phone and iPad. So um, more and more, we're seeing more attention in that area. Um, so I think, you know, these are the recommendations that Height makes in terms of how we can break this <coughs> uh, with four collective action traps. And I think, you know, some some would say this ship has sailed and the challenges of implementing these kinds of changes is, is are, are monumental, really. Um, to say that there should that we should have no smartphones before high school, no social media before 16, and uh, that phone free that schools should be phone free. Now there is um, a considerable amount of effort that's being done to try to make phones uh, unavailable during the school day, but it's an upward battle. And one of the things that people have talked about is that um, the there could be significant negative impacts on an individual child from an individual family to try to enforce this kind of a um, approach when all of the friends are doing everything else. It could just lead to more isolation and more anxiety. And so um, there's been suggestions about trying to um, get the whole cohort of, uh, of friends, families together to sort of take a, a unified approach to being consistent so that the peer group is all taking the same approach. I think that's going to be incredibly challenging to see happen over time. But I think perhaps even more importantly is this notion of trying to create environments where the children have opportunities for more independence, more free play, and more responsibility out in the real world. A lot of that has changed, I think, over the last really 30 or 40 years. Um, and I think those of us who are, are older remember having had a great deal more of independence and a great deal more of control of how we spent our time in play and um, had more responsibility, even with, you know, jobs and stuff when we were very young uh, that are not options or opportunities for kids today. And can we move uh, more in that kind of a direction? Another factor that I think is important that's contributing somewhat to the to the challenges of the emotional well-being of, of our young kids and is that uh, school absences have really exploded almost everywhere um, since the pandemic. And um, this article that was in the New York Times on March 29th uh, talks about that the pandemic changed families' lives and the culture of education and our relationship with school has become optional. And um, you can look at the charts here and you can see that it, it uh, is cross-cutting. It doesn't matter as to uh, what the local child poverty rates or the length of school closures were or the school district size or even the district uh, racial makeup, that although the changes might have started out uh, of, at lower levels, all of them have increased significantly uh, between 2019 and 2023. And when we talk about chronic absenteeism, the definition that's being used for that is to, to basically be absent for more than 10% uh, of school days um, during the course of a school year. Uh, within a 180 day school year, that would be missing about 18 days of school. I was curious when I looked at this, it was interesting the Times had the ability to be able to uh, look at individual school districts and, and what was happening in those districts. and and so we could take a look at what's happening in the state of Ohio in terms of chronic absenteeism. And so here in the top left corner, we have Columbus, Ohio. Um, the astounding numbers are that in 2019, the rate of chronic absenteeism was already 42%. <clears throat> and in 2023, it's up to 58%. Can you imagine that, that the majority of kids are, are chronically absent from school and how can that have an impact on their learning and on the classroom environment um, as a whole. Uh, Cleveland from 32% to 56%. Dayton from 34% to 47%. And then I was curious, well, you know, I happen to live in Oakwood, Ohio, which is said to have one of those um, out, most outstanding school systems in the state of Ohio. I said, well, what's, what's it like there? And of course, in 2019, it was just 4%, but in 2023, it's 12%. And I think, well, oh, it's only 12%, but if you think about it, 
it's tripled. So um, it doesn't seem like any anyone anywhere is immune to this. And this is having, I think, a significant impact on the overall um, learning, cognition, and, and emotional well-being of the kids and families that we serve. So another perspective that's been um, on this was uh, from David French that was in the New York Times on March 28th. This is, uh, <clears throat> you know, that uh, he was commenting on the recent um, legislation that passed in Florida, where Florida has banned kids using social media but argues that it just won't be that simple, you know? Um, and so in Florida, they've said you should have no social media accounts under the age of 14, and you need parental permission under the age of 16. Um, I think that we're all aware um, that in Ohio, a, a law was passed that cracked down on social media use among our youth, but that, that on February, in February, that was blocked. Um, and I think, you know, there's a number of, of ways that we can think about this. You know, one is definitely that smartphones are a prime mover in teen mental health. And that, but some would argue, and I think, um, I think we might agree that parents are better positioned to suppress social media smartphone access than, than the government uh, may be um, poised to do that. Um, the challenge, I think, is some of the things that we've already talked a bit about. <laughs> in that um, there's been a significant transformation over the last few decades, really, in parenting strategies that have led to less free play for kids, more highly managed schedules, some fraying of the social fabric that leads to less in-person interaction, and a constant stream of news uh, that can heighten anxiety. But at the same time, you know, the Supreme Court back in 2011 um, reaffirmed that minors are entitled to First Amendment protection. So where is the sweet spot and how do we facilitate healthy use of the internet in a way um, that doesn't become detrimental to the overall well being of our youth and an entire generation? So, with that background in mind, it's so in, uh, very encouraging uh, to think about, or not so encouraging. To, um, let's spend just a, a few minutes talking about uh, differential diagnosis of. Uh, anxiety in this age group and also uh, how it may present and how we might, uh, what other things we need to be thinking about in children who might present with significant symptoms of anxiety. Um, so we're going to talk primarily about these three anxiety disorders and, and just quickly review the DSM-5 criteria and then spend a couple of minutes just talking <clears throat> about how we might differentiate uh, ADHD, which also is quite common in this age group uh, from anxiety, but also recognizing that there are certainly a significant number of children who exhibit signs of both ADHD and anxiety, but it can be challenging sometimes to tease those two things apart. So separation anxiety, interestingly, in the DSM-5 has the most extensive list of potential symptoms when it comes to childhood anxiety disorders. I think the key thing here is that it's developmentally inappropriate and excessive fear or anxiety concerning separation from those to whom the individual is attached. And I think all of us hear about this all the time. We also know that some degree of separation anxiety is developmentally appropriate at certain stages of early childhood development, especially um, in the uh, uh, those nine to 12 month olds, and again in those uh, 18 to 24 month olds. But if those symptoms persist <clears throat> and are interfering with the ability to function, and a key point here is causing significant distress for at least four weeks, um, then the consideration of separation anxiety is warranted. I'm not going to read through all of those, and you can find these anywhere, and, and you'll have the slides available to you. But really, it's it's the issue of I can't be left alone. Um, and that can be a child that doesn't want their parent to go to the bathroom without them or to go upstairs without them or a willingness to go upstairs by themselves or to sleep uh, by themselves. Um, and then we have children who have generalized anxiety, and they really have excessive anxiety and worry occurring more days than not for at least six months, 
and concerning a number of, event, of events and individual finds it difficult to control the worry. Uh, I, I often, when I think about this, remember one particular nine or 10 month old, nine or 10 year old a number of years ago, who I asked the question, you know, what kind of things do you worry about, about your body or about your health? And uh, the answer that I got was, oh, doctor, I worry about everything. You know, I didn't really need to learn anything more in terms of thinking about the diagnosis, but oftentimes these kids will also have at least one of these following six symptoms, you know, restlessness, feeling keyed up or on edge, being easily fatigued, trouble concentrating, which leads to some of the challenges as it relates to the possibility of ADHD, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. So the worries along with those other kinds of concerns. And then we have social anxiety disorder, which is really a persistent fear of at least six months duration of one or more social or performance situations in which the person's exposed to unfamiliar people or possibly uh, to possible scrutiny by others. Um, and the person recognizes that this fear is unreasonable or excessive, and they try to avoid those situations or else they're endured with very intense anxiety and distress. And um, that can be incredibly debilitating for individuals who are having that kind of experience. So those are the three biggies to think about. When I, when I think about ADHD versus anxiety, I think these are some of the, the things that I think are important to consider. In ADHD, distractibility and inattention is really for no reason whatsoever. But in anxiety, it's because you're, the child is worrying or nervous in their they're off task because they're preoccupied with the things that uh, they're worried about. Um, and they, the, in kids with ADHD, they generally have no physical complaints. Sometimes they will when they're on stimulants, but in general, otherwise they do not. Anxiety frequently has somatic or physical complaints along with it. Um, kids with ADHD that under um, treated or untreated will have difficulty sleeping because they're hyper aroused. Whereas kids with anxiety will have difficulty sleeping because they can't get rid of their anxious thoughts. And then um, obviously in ADHD, the stimulants will decrease the difficulties. And occasionally in children with anxiety, the stimulants may worsen the difficulties. And I've certainly even seen that recently in my own practice in, in, in a few kids. And then of course, from a, a demographic point of view, ADHD tends to be seen more in boys in general, um, recognizing that girls often present with the inattentive form of ADHD, but anxiety in, in nine to 12 year olds tends to be pretty equal between boys and girls, but then drifts more into girls as, as they get older. We'll talk a little bit more about presentations in primary care. I think physical symptoms are common. Complaints, the chief complaint uh, presentation might actually be headache, stomach ache, or chest pain. Uh, very often, those cases, it's important for us to look for underlying degrees of anxiety that may be contributing to that because very often we're not going to find an organic or physiologic explanation for it. And then, of course, sleep disturbances can be another. Um, manifestation. They might, you know, have mental tension, talk about their worries, but sometimes it can be difficult for them to really articulate that and be able to share uh, what's really going on in their mind. So, you know, some of the behaviors that might be um, a concern include not wanting to leave home or safety or the safe person or avoidance of, of feared objects or situations or reminders of them. Uh, speaking only in front of certain people. Of course, there's a group of kids uh, with selective mutism who take that, you know, to a whole extreme. We're not going to really talk about that today, but I think it's fairly common, especially in, in younger children um, before they hit that middle, middle uh, age group. Irritability and arguing for reasons that aren't clear, and then sometimes repetitive play in younger children. I think it's always important for us to, um, when we see kids who are experiencing symptoms of, of anxiety, to uh, consider the possible relationship to either current or past trauma. And um, sometimes that can be difficult 
uh, to discern, but we'll talk a little bit about um, one, how often these things are happening and two, how we might gather that information in a fairly straightforward way. Um, this again is some additional data from right here in Ohio um, that tells us how uh, common these issues are. So the percentage of middle school students who ever saw someone get physically attacked, beaten, stabbed, or shot in their neighborhood, uh, those numbers are, <clears throat> are um, really off the charts. And when you look at them by race, um, you can see um, the, uh, in, the impact that the environment is having on our youth. Again, here, the percentage of middle school students who were ever bullied on school property, those numbers are, are off the charts. Um, well over a third of, and even almost 50% of all children um, having experienced bullying. And then taking that to being um, bullied electronically, you know, which means bullying through texting or Instagram or Facebook or other social media, those numbers too are incredibly high. Um, here's here's the, the percentage of kids who did not go to school because they felt unsafe at school or on their way to or from school. And again, those numbers are incredibly high and have um, significant racial variation and ethnic variation. I'm going to skip this slide um, and just sort of kind of move on, um, I think, and, and uh, think about how do we get an account of these kind of things, because mostly they're not volunteered. They might be ashamed of what's happened or don't want to reveal what's happened. Um, they might not be able to talk about their anxious thoughts. So some of the screening questions that can be helpful are, you know, are, are there things that worry you so much that you can't get them out of your mind? What kind of things are you afraid of? Um, are you worried? Are you often worried? Are you easily scared? Um, I find that um, maybe one of the simplest questions is to ask, to assume that kids are worrying since it's so prevalent. Say, what kind of things do you worry about? Um, and then uh, to this bottom question, you know, what bad, sad, or scary things have happened to you or to your family recently? Um, or even more remotely. But I think those two questions can often get you to where you want to uh, be in terms of understanding what might be driving some of the symptoms that are being presented. If we think about then the impact that trauma may have, it can it can certainly um, manifest in conjunction with the symptoms of anxiety. So we might see avoidance. Uh, we talked about that social anxiety and avoidance, but it could be that that's related to trauma. We can see hypervigilance and we can see some re-experiencing. So we need to be thinking about that um, when we see kids who, who have manifestation of anxiety and thinking about whether there might be trauma that's really driving that. Um, and then you want to get an idea if it's if it's um, if you get positive answers about how much it's interfering with that everyday life and um, is it leading to you feeling uh, physically unwell? And that can give you an idea about the sense of urgency and the need um, to engage others in supporting the child and the family. Questionnaires can some, you know, can be an adjunct to uh, the history and trying to understand this. Um, if we look at commonly used broad category, common universal tools like the pediatric symptom checklist and the strengths and difficulties questionnaires, they do tap into anxiety at a surface level, but probably not really um, at a level that would help you even think about differential diagnosis or to really get a sense about the role of trauma. There are a couple of tools that are out there that have been broadly recommended, including the SCARED or the Screen for Childhood Anxiety Related Disorders. And I pulled this example of it off of the AAP uh, website. Um, so it's readily available there. Um, and it has a scoring system that really helps you to break down even a differential diagnosis in terms of um, what you might be thinking about in terms of the type of anxiety disorder. And then similarly, um, 
If we wanted to understand trauma a little bit further, there is a tool called the Child Adolescent Trauma Screen uh, that it also I pulled off of the ADHD website, but also additional tools are available at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network website. Um, and there's an entire clinical guide um, for administration and use of this tool if you decide that you'd like to add it to your own personal toolbox. Um, and then too, there is a screen for PTSD after a traumatic event <laughs> with this 10 question survey um, that's called the Child Trauma Screening Questionnaire. If a, if a child answers five of these um, in a, an affirmative way, um, then that is suggestive of PTSD. And again, would really warrant engaging our mental health professionals in supporting that child or family. Um, so, and, and of course, we know that it's hard to get kids the, the help that they need. And, and this is just a good example of that. Again, from the YRBS, the percentage of middle school students who most of the time are always get the kind of help they need. You can see that it's about 25% overall. Um, and this is among students who report having felt sad or empty or hopeless or angry or anxious. So a specific subset of the students who are at higher risk and yet are still feeling like they're not getting the help that they need. So it really then behooves us to really think about how can we be helpful um, as pediatric professionals um, I, I found this uh, acronym that was really developed by Larry Wisso, who is a, a triple boarded pediatrician and child and adolescent psychiatrist who was at Hopkins for many years and now is at the University of Washington, um, developed this acronym uh, called HELP. Um, and H stands for hope, you know, that we offer hope. It helps to facilitate coping. E stands for empathy, that we communicate empathy by listening attentively and acknowledging the struggles and distress. And, um, and then L is L squared because it's two language that we use the child or family's own language, not a clinical la label to reflect our understanding of the problem. And then we communicate loyalty to the family by expressing our support and our commitment to help now and in the future that we're, we're gonna be there for them. And then the P is really three Ps, permission, partnership, and plan. Um, asking the family permission to learn more about the issues and the potential um, potential that trauma might play a role. And then, um, then uh, identify yourself as a partner uh, with the child and family that uh, you're going to help to break down the barriers to getting the help that they need. And then develop a plan uh, that is going to help things to um, move forward. So help. This is just an example <clears throat> of, uh, of an anxiety patient action plan that you know, we're going to discuss some tools here in the next couple of minutes that uh, can be made available for our, our youth and families to um, prevent, um, respond to, and dealing with even panic attacks. So they, they have, just like you have an asthma action plan, you could have an anxiety action plan. And Lisa Zimnick, who's now with us here at Dayton Children's, put this together years ago when she was in primary care pediatric practice and helped us disseminate this when we had our uh, Building Mental Wellness um, statewide learning collaborative with the chapter a number of years ago. There's another tool that uh, Mark's going to make available to you uh, that uh, is a similar tool that a family can fill out to try to um, have a plan of action. Uh, to address these things as well. Um, I, I think one of the really important things for all of us to remember when it, we think about how we can support children who are experiencing anxiety is that we're experts on a number of strategies that can be incredibly beneficial. We know the importance of, of sleep and good sleep and supporting children and families and establishing good sleep habits. We know the importance of nutrition we know the importance of physical activity. Um, we know what the resources are in our community with mental health care, but we may need to be advocating for even more supports and, and expanding our own role. Um, we know 
about access to nature and the the benefits of supporting re relationships and in uh, pro promoting overall health and well-being. And we can learn a few mindful practices that we can share with others as well. And this is taken from the ACEs Aware um, web, uh, website that uh, was developed out in California. So there are lots of practice-based interventions to consider. Uh, one of them that I think sometimes we um, may downplay the importance of is our own ability to provide education about what anxiety is and how um, common it is and, and that it's normal for there to be some level of anxiety and some is a good thing, um, but uh, if they stop us uh, from doing the things that we need to be doing on a daily basis, then uh, then we need to be thinking about how we can uh, put some additional interventions into place. And certainly uh, bibliotherapy or providing you know reading materials for families, these are just two examples of uh, resources that are out there. There's really a myriad of resources, and I think you'll find your favorites that you might want to suggest and recommend to families, but that can often be a way to help a child to understand um, what they're going through um, and a chance for a parent and child to do that together by reading together. And then this is really a, a, a nice book for adults to, to better understand. <clears throat> anxiety and stress and its impact on all of us. The other thing that we're experts at is knowing that routines are really important and helpful for, for all of us and uh, are particularly helpful for kids um, with anxiety because most of the time kids with anxiety don't like surprises. You know, they worry a lot about what's gonna happen next. And so if they have a predictable routine, it leads to fewer surprises and less stress for everyone. And that includes a daily routine as well as a sleep routine. And similarly with nutrition and exercise to have good routines related to that as well. Um, I think sometimes we can, uh, we can teach folks strategies for helping to stop some of those automatic negative thoughts that they may have. And there's a number of techniques and strategies that are out there related to that. This, this slide just sort of outline some of those in terms of mind reading, fortune telling, always or never thinking and guilt beatings. And I think, you know, depending on our level of interest that we can dive a bit deeper in there, there's a resource here that you can take a look at. <clears throat> I think that what this is a very simple and, and tool that you may wanna really um, encourage your families to use is the worry box. Um, put your worries in the box and leave them there. Um, and a lot of times doing this at bedtime uh, because so many of those kids have that anxious preoccupation at nighttime that this can be a nice tool that's very simple to put into play. The child can help to make the worry box and um, then they can write down their worries and put them in the box where they can't be bothered and then keeping it in a safe place outside their room so that the, the worries are completely gone. Um, there are lots of other tools that are are very readily available and 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 all of us probably have our own tools that we use to manage our own stress and certainly we should but you know long list whether it's bubbles or play-doh or textured cloths or super power um imagination or the use of lotion or music all of those things can be readily available that we could help children and families identify as things that they already know help to relieve stress and how can they augment those experiences in times when they're starting to feel like they're getting worried. I think too, this whole notion of expose, using exposure to tackle fears is, is another highly effective intervention for anxiety. Um, it, it could be that your colleagues and mental health professionals are gonna be best um, poised to be able to help support a family to identify a step-by-step -step approach uh, to using exposure to tackle fears, but it is a highly effective approach um, that can be uh, tremendously helpful. And so one to be thinking about and thinking about um, in terms of any referrals that you might make as well. Kids can learn to use guided imagery and progressive muscle relaxation as well. A lot of times our, our behavioral health professionals can help our, our kids to learn these skills as well. But of course, we also know that cognitive behavioral therapy 
um, is sort of the keystone approach to working with children um, who have anxiety and, and depression as well. It needs to be goal oriented and problem focused and focused on what's happening in the current time space. Um, it emphasizes collaboration and active participation. It teaches children to identify, evaluate, and respond to the bad thoughts that the negative thoughts they're having. Um, and then there's lots of different techniques to change thinking, mood, and behavior. And their kids can be taught specific strategies for coping with their difficulties. I think that it's important for us to at least have an understanding of that so that when we make a referral um, for behavioral health services that we can talk about what we would expect. I've often said that if I you know, refer somebody to a mental health professional, um, when they call to make an appointment, they say they want to get cognitive behavioral therapy. And if somebody asks, what is that to hang up? Um, I think that in today's world, that's happening less and less. But it's really important that our patients are getting good, solid, evidence-based um, intervention. And cognitive behavioral therapy is really uh, the way to go. Um, medication also has an important role. Um, and the best data that we have suggests that combination treatment with medication and counseling is actually preferred for most case cases, even in this 9 to 12-year-old age group that we're talking about. Uh, combination treatment will usually have about an 80% response rate, whereas if you use medication or cognitive behavioral therapy alone, you'll get about a 55 to 60% response rate, and the placebo response is less than 25%. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are, are really the first-line treatment. Um, FDA approval um, based on studies of obsessive compulsive disorder is available for sertraline, fluoxetine, and fluvoxamine. Um, you have to remember that it takes four to six weeks to see benefits and it's likely that you're gonna need to adjust the dose. On the other hand, you know, I had a patient, 17 year old I saw on Friday who we started her on sertraline and the family called yesterday and said they wanna increase the dose. Um, I said, well, I think we need to wait a little longer than four days as opposed to four weeks to kind of see where she's going to land before we get to a therapeutic level. Um, Deloxetine, um, whose brand name is Sabalta, is the only FDA-approved medication for anxiety, um, and it's approved for generalized anxiety disorder in children aged 7 to 17 years, but the studies would indicate that it's probably not quite as effective as the SSRI. So, Although it's FDA approved, it may not really be your first line choice. Um, but uh, you know, usually you would start it at 30 milligrams once a day for a couple of weeks before you consider increasing it to um, 60. And really the recommended dose range is 30 to 60 milligrams a day um, for most patients. <clears throat> the side effects are most commonly headache, gastric distress, or insomnia. This chart just gives you an idea of where the FDA approvals are. Um, and uh, knowing that uh, I had added deloxetine uh, to the previous slide, uh, but you can see that in terms of OCD, um, sertraline, fluoxetine, and, and uh, fluoxetine and fluvoxamine are approved in the younger age group. Uh, I, I, I tend to um, tend to usually uh, ask the question of the family, which medicines work best for your family, since we know that it tends to, anxiety tends to run in the family, and that often influences my choice. But I tend, I tend to lean more towards sertraline and fluoxetine as my first line choices. And oftentimes there's been a parent that's had great benefit from one or the other of those two particular medications. And since the cytochrome system has a strong genetic component that can be uh, a quick pharmacogenomic assessment. Um, so the dosings are listed here. I'm not going to go over those in, in detail. Um, uh, the young lady that I started on sertraline on Friday, we started her actually on um, 50 milligrams because she was 17 and really an adult at this point in time. But you generally start low and go slow and find the sweet spot for where the benefit is there. And then if they do benefit from it, I usually recommend that they continue it for a year. 
at, at a minimum. And usually if we're gonna try to taper off of it to do it during the summer months when they're under less stress, um, but it, because this is tends to be a chronic issue and it tends to wax and wane, it's very likely that the kids may benefit from uh, long-term uh, use of uh, one of the medications. So that's my wrap up. There's a number of references here for you to consider. Um, I've got, we've got about 10 minutes left uh, for questions and um, I welcome any of those. I see that there's several uh, in the chat here. So let me see what they're saying. Um, Interested in my thoughts about anxiety as a cause of intermittent explosive disorder in children with ACEs. Well, I think I think that does get to the question of of, of trauma and how it manifests itself, um, and making sure that any time that we're seeing kids who are having significant behavioral disturbances, whether they're internalizing like anxiety or whether they're externalizing like you're describing with intermittent explosive disorder. We need to be thinking about um, the potential that trauma is influencing those behaviors, um, whether they're internalizing or externalizing. Is there any information on what percent of the chronically absent students have school avoidance or anxiety or mood as a contributing factor? We definitely have a number of these kids in our practice. I think that's a great question. I have not seen any data that have really taken that deep dive into that yet, but I think you're absolutely right that, you know, it becomes a, a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Um, how much of this is related to what's happened in the world around them <clears throat> that's led to the potential uh, changes in their emotional functioning or, or do they have underlying emotional tendencies that are genetically based that are now exacerbated by what's happened in the world around them I think both of those things are are potentially happening. Um, any other questions? Does anybody want to um, shout out a question or add another question to the uh, chat? Either way, I'm happy to happy to hear from folks. We could probably stop sharing, Mark. Right? And just, uh, yeah, you're welcome. To, yep. <clears throat> Yeah, and if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question or put it in the chat box, we have just a couple of minutes left. Yeah, we've got about eight minutes, so plenty of time. You know, we covered a lot of ground. When uh, I was asked to do this, they asked me if I wanted to talk about anxiety and depression, and I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I think there's enough to say about anxiety. Um, but uh, particularly since anxiety is really more common in this age group than depression is. Um, anxiety seems to be so common. Do you think we should, there is an avenue for starting to teach kids relaxation techniques across the board to all kids? Boy, that's a great question. I think, you know, I think the answer is probably yes. You know, I think that then the question becomes uh, when, uh, when and where should that be taught? You know, um, the earlier, the better. You know, I, I've, uh, I've, I know some three and four year olds that are doing yoga with their moms, you know, and, uh, and they're enjoying it. And I think they're getting something out of it. And, uh, you know, I think um, that there have been efforts to um, teach mindfulness in school settings um, to young children. And uh, there potentially, I think, is great value to that. It's something that all of us could benefit from. So great question. I volunteer at a, a grade school up the street from me, and there is a first grade teacher who's teaching all the first graders square breathing in her classroom as part of a classroom management. Awesome. But, but when those kids are on the playground, I've also noticed that classroom doesn't get into fights. And I have no idea if there's a connection. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I live across the street from an elementary school um, and uh you know, I often say that uh, that uh, it's a little noisy, but it's joyful noise. So that's a good thing. You know. Any other comments or questions? Well, if not, we can wrap up a few minutes early. Sure, uh, and I'll just say a couple of things 
to uh, unless you have something else, Dr. Ruby. I was just going to thank everybody for um, being with us today. And then I would just uh, mention that this video will be posted um, on the Ohio AAP website as well as um, some resources that go along with this. And then Dr. Dewey mentioned that I'll be including in my email um, that handout um, for you to use as well. Um, and of course, we want to give a big thank you to Dr. Dewey for an excellent presentation today. Um, and thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the uh, retirement uh, well wishes. I appreciate that. <laughs>